All right. So this lecture will be on one of the manual therapies that we'll do a little bit with uh, during the hands-on portion. It's called positional release therapy or PRT. Um, PRT is not really new in the AT world. Um, a lot of times it could be referred to as um, uh, an indirect manual therapy. Um, we'll learn, you know, the basic scientific theory behind positional release, uh, the difference between strain counter strain and positional release therapy. Strain counter strain is a very similar technique. Um, and then understand how to palpate and then subsequently treat patients with PRT. There's an awesome book uh, by Dr. Tim Spiker, who is an athletic trainer. He owns his own private practice actually in Salt Lake City, Utah. And he only treats people with PRT. Now he knows other, obviously, treatment paradigms and whatnot, but he mainly uses PRT as his, his treatment uh, of choice for patients. Um, I've been to two different courses with him. Uh, was that a spine and pelvis course many years ago? And then actually a couple months ago in, in May, I went to the upper quarter course, which was pretty cool because it had to do with the cervical spine, you know, your shoulders, upper thoracic spine. And it's, it's interesting. And even from five years ago till today, you know, things have changed. You know, if I, I took that original course probably about four to five years ago now, things have definitely changed. Um, I have his textbook. It's unfortunately packed somewhere in the house and, and whatnot. Um, so this PRT is also known as strain counter strain, right? So in positional release, or yeah, positional release, we use a position of comfort to resolve somatic dysfunction. What is somatic dysfunction? It's a disturbance in the sensory or proprioceptive system that results in a spinal segment tissue fac facilitation and inhibition. So let's say you have a trigger point. Most people have them in their upper neck, right? But let's say we have a trigger point here on your wrist extensors. Uh, tennis elbow. Ow, oh, got a trigger point here. If I have a somatic dysfunction in this in, in this muscle here, my wrist extensors, that could lead to tissue tissue facilitation inhibition of that tissue. So let's say I'm picking something up and you know shoveling. Let's say my other muscles in my elbow are going to enact, enable, or I guess enable. Um, inhibit, I should say not enable, inhibit my proper muscle from doing the work. And what this means is we're not using the body the most effectively biomechanically. Um, so it becomes very biomechanically insufficient and can lead to injury in other areas. So if you have trigger points or uh, an area of tenderness that's allowing a, to be fasciculated, um, facilitation, that can cause dysfunction elsewhere. So pretty common in the pelvis area, right? Let's say you have low back pain and, um, you know what, hold that example, we'll come back to that, we'll come back to that. Uh, somatic dysfunction, so tissues often become kinked, knotted, resulting in pain, spasm, loss of range of motion. And if you think of PRT, positional release, uh, it helps to unkink the tissues by taking the tension off the knob. So when we took the course, I have a, which I'm call thing here, another iPhone uh, headphone set, right, connector. But when we took the course with him, uh, he would always say, all right, let's kink this up and then pull on it really tight. It's going to become a bigger knot, right? But if you pull on the knot loosely, it will untangle a lot easier. So in his book, he actually says it's like the opposite of stretching. If a patient has a tight, tender uh, area on the calf, if you stretch that person, you dorsiflex the foot to stretch the calf, what might this lead to? All right, so as I was saying, the opposite of stretching. If a patient has a tight, tender uh, area on the calf, you dorsiflex the foot to stretch the calf. But what might this lead to? What might this lead to in other areas of the lower leg? So that's just something for you to think about. With PRT, you'd place the 
uh, the tender point in a position of greatest comfort, which is plantar flexion. I can't talk. Plantar flexion. Shorten the muscles tissue in order to relax them. Now you might add inversion, eversion um, of the ankle. You might do something with the toe, depending. Um, and you might actually do some compression or distraction, depending on the technique. Tender points. So what is a tender point? Tender points are not always associated with hyper-irritable bands of tissue, but are discrete areas of tissue tenderness that can occur anywhere in the body. Most people have tender points, right? Most people have tender points in their upper neck. Um, most common neck, upper uh, shoulder blade, scapula area. Malfacial trigger points are slightly different. These points are hyper-irritable nodules of knotted muscular tissue that often entrap nerves and local vessels cause pain, inflammation, loss of function. It's usually found in top bands of muscular tissue and can cause local or referred pain. A latent trigger point requires manual stimulation to activate a potential pain or sensory response. So in these areas that are top bands and cause local or referred pain, so you push on it, Let's say here on the elbow, you push on the, the wrist extensor, ow, that hurts. Okay, that's a local pain. But say you push on this and now you're getting numbness, or no, I shouldn't say numbness, but you're getting pain into the hand, that could be a referred pain pattern. You see this a lot with the neck musc muscles. Ugh, I can't talk. <laughs> and the same thing with the upper neck. The strain counter strain, a little bit different, but essentially the same concept. Somatic dysfunction can result from an increased gain in, or hypersensitivity of the stretch reflex. Uh, the stretch, this heightened stretch reflex can result in the muscle spindle dysfunction. That means sensitivity to stretch was increased or sustained by gamma gain, which enhances sensitivity to the muscle spindle. We'll talk more about that when we do some hands-on stuff um, in the summer here in the next couple weeks. Um, this tissue assessment and documentation. So it, this is kind of the older way, if you will. Um, doesn't really align to what we do clinically. You can see the old method doesn't align. I, I wrote that on here, but there's a book by this guy named D'Ambrosio that kind of, probably back in 2001, that kind of uh, made position release kind of popular. And now that Spiker came forward, he has his book and, and, and whatnot. He's tweaked a little bit of things here and there, and even when, when my wife and I actually took the course, what he says in the book, like, hey, pressure hold this for this many seconds. Well, in reality, not really. Um, so in this tissue assessment documentation, AT should move the body segment and its tissues through the, their range of motion while palpating the tender point with some maximum pressure. So you don't want to dig into the muscle at all. You're essentially pushing in once you find the trigger point. To, to find the trigger point, that's fine. You can dig in and find that trigger point or tender point. Once you find that, you essentially have your thumb or fingers, whatever fingers you want to use, and we'll, we'll practice this um, in a couple weeks, gently on the muscle, and then you put them in the position of comfort. You do that, though. The patient doesn't move. Uh, what we found when we we're doing the last course was breathing really does help. So taking deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth uh, definitely does help um, that facilitation, uh, fasciculation, I should say, of the muscle. So when you actually do this, you might actually feel the, the tissue fasciculating or twitching almost. And you see on here, I put hold for 90 seconds. Well, according to Spiker, that 90 seconds really, eh, if the tender point or trigger point's been there for a longer period of time, that 90 seconds, say, it won't be enough. Um, if it's a very hot, if you will, trigger point, that 90 seconds, you might feel it within the first few seconds, not 90 seconds, but the, the more chronic that patient has been in, the pain, uh, the longer that patient's had that trigger point, the probably the longer it's going to take for you to feel that fasciculation. And all that fasciculation is is like a little twitch of the muscle underneath, almost like a muscle spasm. The patient almost never feels it too, which is kind of creepy, um, but you will feel it. And the first time you feel it, you're going to be like, whoa. <laughs> so this NPRS, numeric pain rating scale. So whenever you, whenever you treat a patient with positional release, you want to get a pain scale pre and post. Uh, this is essential because you won't know 
if you actually help their pain or not. All right. So I use the NPRS. It's the recommended in place of other tools. There's a visual analog scale. There's an old schematic chart. The NPRS is a zero to 10 scale. Zero equals no pain, 10 worst pain ever. When you palpate into that uh, the tender point, ask the patient what's their pain like there. You can actually use a Sharpie, eh, probably not Sharpie, magic marker, something that can erase pretty easily. Sharpies don't erase. If you ever watched that Friends episode, uh, you guys probably didn't watch Friends back in the day, but it's on Netflix. Uh, Sharpie doesn't erase very easily. So use a pencil, use something because you can mark a little X or, or a dot where that patient's pain is. And you can even write on that patient. That's fine. So your goal is to decrease their pain, right? So once you get that pain, mark it down, write down what that pain scale is, and then feel for the twitch response. Get them in a the position of comfort, that fasciculation. Hold that position of comfort uh, in that position to hold until either completely gone or subsided greatly. So once you get them into that position, you hold them there, that position of comfort, the POC, you hold them there until the fasciculation ends. If you can feel the fasciculation, if you can't feel the fasciculation, I, I, that's happened to me, I hold it a couple minutes, redo the pain scale, palpate again, same spot, redo the pain scale, and if it went down, awesome. If it not, let's tweak something here. Again, very light pressure though. This fasciculatory response method is out of the Spiker textbook. You actually won't find any of this information in your <laughs> book for the class. So AT may feel the fasciculatory response with light touch and fasciculations have sh been shown to stop with too much finger pressure, often appear after a short time while holding a position, a tissue in the position of comfort when initially it was absent about 30 to 60 seconds in be elicited or elevated with deep breathing, regardless of its location. And I agree, that one is huge. And then be enhanced with compression, distraction, or translation if that is applied to a joint or tissue's fascia along the position of comfort. So let's say we're doing the elbow again. You might want to distract or even compress to feel that more. And you'll see that the positions you get in might be a little crazy. Um, again, same thing, just continued. The fasciculations may reappear or have been shown to reappear upon the return of the tissue body segment to its neutral position. If that does occur, it requires additional treatments where it occurs in the range of motion and can occur as a result of from another mild facial trigger or influence of other tender point trigger points in another area if the tissue doesn't stop fasciculating after five minutes. And increase in cessation or release time that correlates the amount of the time the patient has been in uh, pain. So the longer you're in pain, the longer it's going to take to release that pain, if you will. So chronic pain patients, right? And you actually see a lot of them in AT. Strain counter strain versus PRT. And you can see this little chart here. I'm not going to go over every single thing here. But the big thing is uh, feel for that fasciculatory response. Get them into the position of comfort. You don't want maximal pressure. You want a very light, light pressure when you're once you found the trigger point or tender point area. And essentially, you're shortening the tissue. Right? So if you're trying to stretch the calf example, no. Plantar flex, and then invert, evert, depending where on the, the calf they may have a uh, trigger point. If it's the lateral aspect of the leg, you probably want to evert. If it's the medial aspect of the leg, you probably want to invert. Right? I have a handout. I'll, uh, Pull those up in a second, actually, that is on Blackboard. And then the indications, actually, I combined, I, I put all these, all three of these handouts into one handout. It's up on Blackboard. So indications and contraindications, why would you use this technique? Essentially for pain, right? Acute, subacute, chronic pain, or neuropathic pain, somatic pain, spasm, uh, range of motion deficit, actually fibromyalgia, peripheral sensitization, some post-concussive syndrome. There's some more research being done right now on post-concussion stuff. Um, it's not there yet, but it's coming out. Headaches, myofascial pain syndrome, cumulative trauma. Why you wouldn't want to do this, and this is pretty much common, you know, most why you wouldn't do any manual therapies, essentially, right? Open wounds, infection, nerve root compression, acute, DVT, so blood clot, pain or neurological treat symptoms during treatment, a new fracture, aneurysm. Acute concussion, interesting, but it can be used for post-concussion syndrome. And people are doing research on the acute concussion. 
relative contraindications, maybe stenosis if they have sutures, it's a closed wound, uh, herniated disc even. So here is the handout. Pull that up for you. It's positional release therapy guidelines. And this first page really talks about how to find the trigger points. If there's a road trigger point, treat the one on the road that's the most tender, and then go back. Anterior tissues are typically treated with flexion. Right? So if it's in the anterior aspect of the body, we're doing some kind of flexion. So biceps, we're going to flex the biceps somehow. Posteriors with extension. Not always, but th these are general rules that work almost all the time. A lateral aspect, you might have to do some kind of side bending or rotation. Treatment in all positions should include some manipulation of the treatment planes when possible. Joint or tissue distraction, compression, translation. And we'll practice this a little bit. Um, it, yeah, this one is huge. The first time I ever had PRT done, we did a lower body course. Like I said, we're not a lower body, but uh, spine and pelvis course when I was doing my doctorate in Idaho. And whoa, Dr. Spike had told us we'd be sore, but the, the next day, we, I think it was a two and a half, two day or two and a half day course. And uh, after the first day, whatever, you go home, you actually feel like you're drunk. Um, and then the next day, you wake up and you're like, whoa, so sore. Um, but after that, you feel good. You know, two days later, you have no pain. That's not uncommon for patients to come in after you've done this and say, yeah, I felt like I was drunk. Um, not that, you know, 16 year old high school athlete should know what that feels like. Um, but you know, they may say that to you, right? And you could see the amount of finger pressure, joint manipulation, and all this stuff on that page. And then a slight general guideline procedure here, how to um, do things essentially, right? So how do you palpate? And then how do you treat? And I'm not going to go through every single one of these things, um, but it's, it's pretty easy. It, it, yeah, it's pretty easy. So with positional release, we might not be able to get a, a ton of it in this summer um, because we do have a lot of modality stuff, as you know, to go over. But I know Dr. Fiox done a few of these courses as well, and you'll do them eventually, but I want you to be exposed to this. And again, the, the textbook is called Positional Release Therapy by Dr. Tim Spiker. It's probably, I don't even know how much it is on Amazon anymore. Um, here. Yep. See, I got everything open here. Uh, yep. Release therapy by Spiker. <clears throat> PRTI is his course. So his book on human kinetics is uh, actually as an ebook is sixty bucks. That's actually not bad um, on it. Amazon here. It's the Clinical Guide to Positional Release Therapy. So hardcover, 72 bucks. I like it, but I want you guys to be exposed to it before you go out and buy it and all that stuff, right? So it's, it's definitely a good book. If you are interested in doing some positional release courses, prt-i.com is the website, and you can sign up for courses. As a student, you actually get a cheaper discount. And I think Dr. Uh, Fiok is actually trying to get Dr. Spiker and, and uh, his people out to George Mason in the fall, I believe. I know she was talking last time I spoke with her to try to set that up. So look forward to that too. But if you get a little bit of exposure to it beforehand, awesome. Um, I think that's all for now. Let me know if you do have any questions.